Good morning, it's uh, two minutes past 11, so uh, welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us on day one of Wales Tech Week and welcome to our police webinar. This is called Preventing Individuals from Becoming Involved in Cybercrime. I'm Detective Constable Will Farrell and I'm from the Northwest Regional Organised Crime Unit. I'm going to be taking you through the first half of the event and we're also joined later on by DC, uh, uh, DC Emia Jones from our counterparts in South Wales. They're called Tarion, and Emia is going to be covering the second half of the presentation. So uh, before we go any further, as is usual with these kind of events, um, just a little bit of housekeeping. So we're scheduled in for one hour. It may be a little bit sooner than that. Uh, hopefully at the end of the presentation, we'll have time to take questions from you. Um, it is a mass audience event, so please make sure that your microphone is muted throughout the webinar. Uh, we have set aside an hour, hopefully about 10 minutes for questions at the end. And with that in mind, if you uh, wish to ask a question, please use the QA facility uh, on Zoom at the bottom of the screen. And I'll be uh, monitoring questions later on. Um, so please feel free to ask questions as we go through the presentation. This event is facilitated for us today by Technology Connected and we're kindly assisted today by Carl from the Technology Connected team and Carl is making sure that things uh, run as smoothly as they can for us uh, in the background and we are all on our home Wi-Fi connections so don't be surprised by the odd glitch or two. My uh, broadband isn't great at the moment. Uh, just some background about uh, why we are here. Wales uh, Technology Week is a unique interactive festival of virtual events showcasing the breadth, strength and diversity of Wales tech industry and we are really privileged today to be uh, uh, talking to you on day one of the event. Let's hope it's the first of many such festivals. So today, as you can see from your screen, we're going to talk to you today about how the police prevent cybercrime and specifically our Cyber Choices Outreach Programme and uh, loads of opportunities available to young people. And off the back of the webinar, we also hope to strike up new and exciting relationships with partners and uh, start new collaborations all across Wales. So please do feel free to uh, get involved, ask us questions and contact us uh, after the event to find out more about what we do. Uh, our details are on the screen, as you can see. Um, I'll give you a couple of seconds to capture our details before we move on. So, let's start the presentation. We're going to talk to you today about the Cyber Choices Network. I'm going to give you some awareness about how it all works. So the Cyber Choices Network is a program delivered by the Regional and Local Cyber Choices Network, which is coordinated by the National Crime Agency. We've got 10 regions across the country, 43 local police forces with a dedicated cyber choices officer in each one of these police forces. So just to run through them, you've got the Northeast, Yorkshire and Humber, us highlighted in red in the Northwest, also covering North Wales. That's our logo there. We also have Tarion, Emmy is from Tarion. He's going to be talking to you shortly. We have the West Midlands, East Midlands, our fine colleagues in the Eastern region, the Southwest, and London and the Southeast. So that's basically the makeup of the Cyber Choices Network across the UK. And all officers are capable of identifying vulnerable young people in their area for Cyber Choices interventions. Before we go any further, it's important to just give you a bit of an overview of the different types of cyber crime that we see in the police. We can broadly break them down into two types of cyber crime. The first, is cyber enable crime. Now these are more traditional crimes which can be committed without technology but they can also be committed using technology. Now examples of this could be 
stealing someone's identity or making online threats, malicious communications, or even selling illegal items on the dark web, such as drugs or guns or even people. So in summary, cyber enable crime are crimes that can occur without computing technology, but computing technology has been used to enhance the crime. Moving on to the second definition, cyber dependent crime. This is a crime where technology is necessary to commit the crime itself. The crime cannot take place without the use of technology. That's the important distinction between the two. You need technology to commit the crime. As important as it is to tackle cyber enable crime, this is not what we're going to talk about today. We are focusing on cyber dependent crime. It's sometimes called pure cyber crime where a computer is needed to commit the crime. I'm gonna give you three examples. So the first is a denial of service attack. Many of you on the webinar are probably aware of that, but for those of you who are not sure what that is, I'll give you a definition. So a denial of service attack is where the offender attacks a network resource on the internet, such as a website, making it unavailable for legitimate users. For example, maybe in uh, your business, you're selling face masks online, for example, and you do this through your website. So when an attack is taking place, the website is flooded with data and can't cope with the repeated incoming requests. It then falls offline, meaning that people can't access your website, people can't buy your face masks. Imagine if you were a business and all your financial transactions took place through the website. If people can't buy your products, you can't make any money. And with sustained attacks, companies can be severely affected or even go out of business. There's also a huge reputational risk for organizations. We also see denial of service attacks commonly with young people playing online games. Now, this is where one gamer might use a malicious tool to knock other users from the game. This may seem like a bit of fun or mischief, but conducting such activity is a serious offence under the Computer Misuse Act 1990. Emir is going to talk uh, a little bit more about that later on. In a distributed denial of service attack, a DDoS attack, the incoming traffic flooding the victim originates from many different sources. This effectively makes it impossible to stop the attack simply by blocking a single source. The different sources could be a network of infected computers, all of which used, are used to launch an attack on one target at the same time. The second example of cyber dependent crime we see a lot of in Wales are ransomware attacks. Now, ransomware is a type of malware that threatens to publish the victim's data or block access to the victim's data unless a ransom is paid. And we see advanced ransomware, which encrypts the victim's files, making them inaccessible. And then the criminal will demand a ransom payment to decrypt the data. And that's usually uh, in cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin. Ransomware attacks are typically, ca typically carried out by using what's called a Trojan, which is disguised as a legitimate file, and the user is tricked into downloading or opening that file when it arrives in an email. It's a, a dodgy email attachment. One high-profile example of ransomware you may remember was the WannaCry worm a few years ago, which badly affected the NHS uh, the worm travels automatically between computers without any user interaction. Um, when it happens to the NHS, for a brief period of time, hospitals were cancelling operations and turning people away at the door, putting people's lives at risk. Ransomware is a massive problem in the UK for individuals and for businesses. We've seen companies go out of business as, as a result of these kind of attacks. And without proper security and data backup measures in place, a company can lose literally everything with a click of a button. The third type of um, cyber dependent crime we're gonna focus on are remote access Trojans, also known as RATS. This is a malicious piece of software which installed on a victim's computer without their knowledge. The, a criminal can access all data on an infected computer or device. Just imagine this on your own personal machine at home. It's highly intrusive stuff. A criminal can monitor your usage, see exactly what you're doing, 
install key loggers, get passwords, view your webcam, listen to your microphone. And in some sophisticated cases, a criminal may conduct hostile reconnaissance on their target for months or even years before using the information to launch an attack on a person or a business. Um, we've also seen um, rats, as we call them, more recently, there's been an up upward trend during COVID-19, uh, the lockdown. Um, lots of these are being used in domestic abuse relationships where a perpetrator uses spying tools to coercively control their partner. And a lot of uh, other cybercrime happens as a result of rats, including fraud, identity theft, blackmail, um, and other such offenses. The problem is these tools are readily available, uh, uh, particularly to young people. We do a lot of work to take down marketplaces offering these services. We've had considerable success, but as we all know, the internet is a big place. It's a big problem for us, but the human impacts can't be overestimated. Many of these tools are available and they can literally ruin people's lives. In some cases, a victim has taken their own life as a result of having one of these installed. So uh, moving on to the aims of our Cyber Choices program. Obviously, young people are immersed in technology, phones, tablets, PCs, laptops, games, TVs, and of course, the internet. The Cyber Choices Network was created to help people make positive choices and use their cyber skills in a legal way. Now, there are four main aims of the Cyber Choices program. The first is to educate on the difference between legal and illegal cyber activity, to educate on the legislation, which is the Computer Misuse Act 1990, and we give examples of what is legal and what is illegal and where the boundaries are. Number two, with the information that we provide, individuals should be able to make informed choices on their activities and the path that they choose to take. And if they choose to use their skills illegally, then at least they have a little understanding of the consequences of their actions. Number three, we deter and divert individuals away from cybercrime. This means that not only do we prevent individuals from getting involved in cybercrime in the first place, but we also engage with those who've moved into low level cybercrime offending. And then we work with them, we point them towards positive pathways and prevent them from reoffending. And a big part of what we do is really positive and a lot of uh, our presentation today is focused on this side of things. We promote legal cyber opportunities and we provide young people with the resources that they need to practice and progress their skills in a positive ethical way. And we encourage them to pursue careers in the cyber industry and educate them on the abundance of opportunities available to them uh, and the different pathways that are available. Emir is going to give you some examples of the positive resources we have in a few minutes time. So how, how do we achieve our aims? The, the first thing we do is we engage and we educate. For example, we give presentations to young people in schools all across Wales and the wider uh, UK. We uh, go to youth clubs, conferences, we give CPD to professionals from academia to private industry to charities, anyone really, uh, particularly focusing on those that work with young people. And we attend events such as gaming conferences or computer exhibitions. And we identify, intervene and inspire. We promote interesting and legal ways for young people to develop their cyber skills and we work with partners to deliver events, online competitions, challenges and education initiatives. Emmy is going to mention a few of those in a bit. We also work with those on the periphery of cybercrime and those who may have already moved into cybercrime and we divert them into more positive pathways. You may see the picture on the bottom right hand corner there. Um, that was an event uh, we uh, conducted in the Northwest in Manchester, and uh, that was last year. And that's uh, basically a, a, an offender intervention panel, uh, an intervention day where we invite lots of uh, low level offenders together where they learn um, about how to do things in an ethical way. Uh, a really good event. Um, that's just a picture of 
uh, one last year from Manchester. So we identify uh, individuals committing low-level cybercrime and those with who, who are at risk of doing so in numerous ways. We receive referrals information about individuals who may be on the verge of moving into cybercrime. Now these referrals can be from anyone, teachers, social services, youth workers or parents. Uh, we identify suitable candidates through police investigations. It may not be in the public interest to proceed with a prosecution in some cases and the individual may be referred to the Cyber Choices Programme instead. We also receive direct referrals from members of the public when we're out and about at public events or giving presentations. And once we have a referral, we'll do some work and we'll do some checks and see if they're suitable for the Cyber Choices program. And if they are, we'll start working with them. We can give them one-to-one -one guidance. Most importantly, we show them, um, we tell them about the Computer Misuse Act and we give them some understanding about their behaviours and when their behaviours breach the Computer Misuse Act. And we also explain the consequences of breaking the law. There's many wider consequences. It's not just about getting a criminal record. It's much wider than that and can affect their lives and people around them. We can use positive interventions such as words of advice and day workshops like the one I mentioned before in Manchester, where young people are educated about cybercrime. And a great thing about the day workshops is that delegates attending get the opportunity to test their cyber skills and speak to members of the cybersecurity industry who we also invite along to the uh, day workshops to give inputs. And having the confidence to network is a really important skill for these young, for these young people and we really emphasize and encourage this to the delegates. We're, we've seen some great examples of individuals progressing into legitimate careers as a result of our intervention actions. And we also signpost individuals to resources available to challenge and develop their cyber skills in a legal and ethical way. And many of these resources are free. This is a really interesting uh, report just to give you a bit of background really as to uh, pathways into cybercrime. This is quite an influential report, first published in 2016. Um, it was information taken from a 2015 workshop with penetration testers, and it compared the profiles of cyber criminals and top level penetration testers to identify commonalities and differences which could identify causes of deviance. And the report documented for the first time that gaming was actually quite a common pathway into committing low-level cybercrime. Now, it's important to emphasize that not all gamers are cybercriminals, obviously, and not all cybercriminals are gamers. But for the first time, it was established that gaming was a pathway into cybercrime. And the report reinforced that financial gain is not usually the primary motivation for individuals to conduct this activity. A lot of it was around the challenge, peer recognition, that kind of social recognition in those online environments. That was often seen as more important. And the report highlighted the introduction to positive interventions as a cyber prevention technique. The earlier the intervention, the more likely a positive outcome. So the earlier we can get to these individuals, the more we can shape them to do ethical things instead. This is a quite a um, involved slide. It's, it's a really, really good slide, this one. Lots of information on here. It's a, a chart that shows the most common pathways into cybercrime. This is um, a, uh, this is a slide that was identified as part of that CREST report that I've just mentioned. The um, slide explains when things are legal and when they become illegal. It also details common relationships and parental and education understanding throughout the pathway as well. Now, if you want more detailed, uh, more detailed look at this chart, it is available online. The report is the CREST report. It's called Identify, Intervene and Inspire. As I say, it's from 2016, but still highly relevant. Uh, we still regularly encounter individuals who followed this common pathway into cybercrime. This is uh, the next influential report 
produced by the National Crime Agency off the back of the CRESS report, Pathways into Cybercrime. And this report identified the availability of low-level hacking tools which encourage criminality, uh, criminal behaviour. Um, a lot of these tools, as I've said previously, are readily available. Offenders begin to participate in games, they move into uh, game cheating websites and modding forums and quite often then progress into criminal hacking forums. Offenders perceive the risk of encountering law enforcement as low. This again is something that we see a lot of. Basically, they think they're getting away with it. They don't think the police, law enforcement are watching them. There's also a disassociation by the offenders regarding their online behaviour and the impact of it. Basically, everything is remote. They're hiding behind their computers. The victim could be anywhere in the world. There's that disconnection. They can't see the consequences of their actions. And the report identified that targeted interventions at a young age can lead to positive outcomes and that there's a general lack of awareness about the legality of their actions. Not that many young people know about the Computer Misuse Act. So before we uh, pick up with Emir on some uh, positive diversions, let's just focus on some of the motivations, the reasons we see individuals moving into cybercrime. A lot of it, as I've mentioned, is the kudos, it's, it's the social status. It's to challenge themselves, the peer recognition. It's not so much we find, initially anyway, financial gain. There's the lack of perception of risk. They think they can get away with it. Obviously, we're doing our best to make that not happen. And the availability of online tools and tutorials. You, you can watch anything on YouTube these days. And a lot of uh, young people, uh, particularly uh, looking at YouTube and other sites, uh, find out lots of information through online tutorials. A big one is uh, not challenged at school. We find that uh, by the time kids even get to you know, a top level primary school, they know a lot more than a lot of uh, computer science teachers know. Um, and they don't, feel, they don't feel they're being challenged within that school environment. So they're coming home and experimenting. And the perceived anonymity, they're testing their skills. And it's seen as a victimless crime. They don't understand the consequences of their actions. More recently, of course, with um, coronavirus and the lockdown, um, this has also raised the risk for us of individuals who aren't going to school, um, are bored at home, they're unsupervised, they've got more access to technology, maybe mum and dad or the carers are, are busy trying to, trying to um, you know, conduct their own um, work from home, therefore not focusing on the kids. And it all raises the risk of individuals experimenting with malicious tools and moving into cybercrime, often without even realizing it. So that is the first part of the presentation. Um, now we're going to cross to my colleague in South Wales, Emia, who's going to take you through the rest. Uh, while Emia does this, I'm going to be monitoring for any questions you've submitted. So uh, please submit any questions. Now's a good chance um, and we'll hope to answer them at the end of the presentation. I can see that there are some coming through already. So Emia, it's over to you. Thank you, Will. I'm having difficulty sharing my screen at present. Would you like me to try and assist? transfer host will from yourself. I've now made you the host Emir, so maybe that'll um, work for you. Thank you. There we go. Okay. 
There we are. Thank you, Will. Boradag uh, Vaithion. Good morning. My name is Emma Jones. And as Will said, I work for Tarion as a Cyber Choices Officer. Uh, I cover the three forces of uh, South Wales Police, the Red, and the Premier Force in the area, being Gwent Police. I say this because it's my home force and some of my friends from the other two forces may beg to differ. Each police force also has three Cyber Choices Officer. Our role is to prevent young people becoming involved in cybercrime, and we don't seek to try and criminalize young people. There will be three parts to the presentation from my side of things. For the first part, I will be talking about the law around the Computer Misuse Act and provide some simple examples along with some real life case studies. The second part will be around the work we've done in schools to try and raise awareness of the law and the school's referral process that we have in place. And the third and final part, will be the places we are signposting young people to further develop their skills and interests over the summer period and some of the fantastic career opportunities there are in cyber. I presented to many groups of young people ranging from schools, universities, colleges and a diverse range of community groups. The overall aim of this is to raise awareness of the law and to help young people understand what is legal and what is illegal whilst online. This picture here is a classic illustration of some national operations that we've been part of whereby young people have used stressor tools to carry out DDoS attacks against their friends, thinking, it, thinking it's a bit of harmless fun. I'm sure, Will, that you've encountered this many times in the Northwest, as we have in our region. And what we do find quite often is that some of the young people aren't aware that what they're doing is against the law. Uh, this will lead me nicely on to the next few slides, where I will give an overview of the Computer Misuse Act. Just please. So section one, um, the, um, unauthorized access to computer material. And the example that we have here is Adam shoulder surfs whilst his friends enters their username and password. Adam remembers the login details and without his friend's permission, later logs in and reads the messages. So the act of shoulder surfing is of course, when somebody stands behind you and peers over your shoulder as you're keying in details to your device. I've caught my children doing this a few times during, to me during the pandemic, especially when they're desperate to have the next game in Battle Pass. On a serious note though, um, this has happened in some cases that have been referred to Tarion, and I will talk in more detail about the school's referral process, which is in place all throughout w uh, Wales in a short while. One of the first cases that got referred to Tarion was when somebody gained unauthorized access to a teacher's account in school, he did this when the account password was passed around the classroom and could have had access to a whole raft of confidential information. And clearly this is against the, world, uh, the, the law. There was no formal complaint from the school and I then carried out what's called a cease and desist visit at his home address. Therefore, I spoke to him in company with his parents and issued him with a letter to advise him to cease and desist his activities. He was also referred to a national workshop in London whereby he had inputs from law enforcement, reformed hackers, so people who've been in and out of uh, prison showing the error of their ways, and four prominent cybersecurity companies. This was to try and help him uh, make the correct cyber choices. He was a particularly talented individual and was good at coding and Python and had developed a computer application for family members' workplace. Moving on then, section two uh, of the Computer Misuse Act. This is unauthorized access with intent to uh, or commit or facilitate commission of further offenses. And the example we have here is you leave your tablet on the sofa without your permission, Raj uh, accesses your online shopping account and orders a new computer console using your credit card. You could have a maximum sentence of up to five years in prison and or a fine. And these offences have come to my attention a few times whereby somebody has hacked or gained unauthorised access to another person's gaming account and taken um, over the account and purchased items. Uh, Section 3, Computer Misuse Act. Uh, the definition here is unauthorised access with intent to impair or with recklessness as to impairing operation of a computer. And the example we have is uh, Sarah is playing an online game but her friend scores higher than her. Sarah uses a booter tool to knock them offline and win the game. You could have a maximum sentence of up to 10 years and or a fine. I'm not sure that would happen in, the, in this instance. However, this is without doubt one of the most prominent offenses that young people who I've encountered 
will carry out without realising that they are breaking the law. We want to prevent this from becoming a regular occurrence and this is why our aim is to educate young people and to signpost them to places where they can use their skills in a responsible way. I was delivering a presentation last year to a youth training group and was given an overview of cyber dependent fences when a young lad stuck his hand up and openly admitted to having carried out DDoS attacks. He said that he had been gaming online against a stranger living in a foreign country who had then taught him how to do it. We have also got a team of pursue officers working in our cybercrime department who have prosecuted individuals who have carried out this kind of cyber attack. In these instances, there may, there may be no option due to the seriousness of the offence than to go down this route. For example, uh, there was a college in West Wales that suffered a DDoS attack by one of its former students. The young male carried out the sustained attack over a period of time, which meant the students were unable to upload pieces of coursework, staff were unable to mark coursework, and exams had to be cancelled. So the cyber attack in this case affected a lot of people. Such was the volume of network traffic that was being um, generated that affected the broadband link of two hospitals who were unable to exchange client and patient details. When the individual was arrested, it also uncovered the fact that he was part of a small organised crime group who hacked into several companies across the world. Section 3ZA of the Computer Misuse Act, unauthorised acts causing or creating risk of serious damage. So the example we have here, uh, Kim hacks into a police network. This results in delays to emergency calls and even though it was not her intention, she was reckless in her actions. So you could have a maximum of 14 years in prison or a fine, unless of course there's a, a serious risk of actual harm to national security, uh, in, in which case uh, you could end up having a life imprisonment. And finally then, uh, section 3A, making, supplying or obtaining articles for use in another Computer Misuse Act offence. So Robin downloads software so he can bypass login credentials and hack into his friend's laptop, although he has not even had a chance to use it yet. So you could have a maximum um, sentence of up to two years and or a fine. This is a crime of specific intent, so the person in this instance may not have used the software, but he did in fact intend to hack into a person's computer. Therefore, he or she would be guilty of the offence. There are a number of other um, ways that being involved in cybercrime can affect young people in the short and long term. One of the things that's common with people that have been referred to the Cyber Choices team in Tarion is they have not been in trouble with the police before. And it's often the first time they've had a brush with the law enforcement. Uh, so this can be a real shock to them. If you commit cybercrime, you could be banned from using the internet or having limited usage, or not being able to get the job that they want, or not being able to travel to certain countries. Uh, also, you could have your devices seized, which uh, more often than not are their prized possessions, or being expelled from school. Um, I will pause for a moment on this point. Uh, we recently had a, a referral where somebody had hacked into their school network and this person realised that they were uh, fortunate not to have been prosecuted and he was excluded from school. However, we worked together with the school and the Youth Justice Board and ensured that he had a pathway back into education whilst also um, mo closely monitoring and supervising his computer access at school. There are other co consequences, of course, of, uh, of uh, breaching the Computer, computer Misuse Act such as not being able to get a, into college or university, or all of these things. So um, with some of the uh, case studies I've discussed, obviously it, it shows that cybercrime is not victimless. Um, however, it is often perceived to be, particularly by young people. So there are physical impacts. This could result in the victim feeling stressed and becoming depressed, emotional impacts, so victims can suffer emotional consequences and may feel very embarrassed about what's happened. And there's a whole raft of financial impacts. So um, individuals uh, can be harmed financially, for example, if a victim who pays a ransom to gain access to the most important files they own, they may do this to retrieve lifetime family pictures or important personal documents. 
This will mean that they will suffer financially. And there are impacts on businesses and companies. There's the loss of reputation and consumer confidence. For many small businesses, a single attack can cause irreparable damage, struggling to regain the trust and confidence of the existing customers, not to mention that of new potential customers, or the cost of fixing the issue. So a compromise may require a business to stop online operations, resulting in loss of revenue. This can be devastating. A breach may require the organization to hire specialists, such as penetration testers, developers, and network security special specialists and also uh, the loss of capital and assets. During a security breach, uh, small businesses are likely to lose some, if not all of their working capital and funds. And there are legal difficulties as well. Um, a security breach can put a small business at uh, great legal liability and open themselves up to GDPR fines. This is because the security of a customer's personal and financial information should be a business first priority and any breaches can incur large penalties. So this damage to reputation can affect both individuals and businesses. There's uh, one further case study that I'm gonna go over, uh, which is a National Crime Agency case study, whereby the individual committed very serious cybercrime. Uh, Will has already outlined what a, a DDoS attack is. Uh, this person was disinterested in school from a young age. He got sucked into the world of gaming and started visiting gaming forums for interaction. He became interested in cheating and trolling. He became interested in how to DDoS and started visiting hacking sections of gaming forums. And started um, visiting more notable hacking sites. So he gained proficiency at DDoS attacks, but frustrated at software limitations. And he decided to program his own software aged 15 years old. He then commercialized the software aged 16. And the subject commits nearly 600 attacks against 180 IP addresses aged between 16 and 18 years old. Aged 18, um, he was arrested and found with over 350,000 pounds and nearly 250 uh, Bitcoin profit and tried as a juvenile. He received 24 months imprisonment and, and there was a proceeds of crime payment to be made as well. So we want to prevent these kinds of offences from happening as it can cause serious uh, damage. Moving on to the second part of, of my presentation then, what are law enforcement doing to try and prevent these inc incidents from happening? Well, here in Wales, we are fortunate to have a fantastic network of school community police officers. We have worked together with the school beat coordinators to devise a school's lesson plan that was based on the film that we created called Don't Cross the Line to Cybercrime. So the film, which is aimed at 11 to 14 year olds, portrays a young man called Jack and follows him throughout the day. He discusses a fabulous job offer that he's had and looks forward to a career in cybersecurity. The story takes a surprising twist when he reveals that he committed serious offences such as hacking into networks and stealing bank details. He then describes how he got investigated by the police and later had his dream job offer withdrawn because he'd been convicted of a crime. So the message is a simple one. Don't cross the line to cybercrime. I've delivered this lesson many times throughout the region, as have my colleagues from Schoolbeat. Uh, the latest figures show that the lesson has been delivered uh, 156 times all over Wales to an audience of over 3,500 pupils. The school resource and film is available for anybody to use. Both the film and lesson are available bilingually in Welsh and English, and there's also a subtitled version. It can be found on Hub and the Schoolbeat website under the Partners tab. We've also got a school's referral form, which is backed up by a policy document and can also be found on Hub. You will find on their contact details for Will's team in the North West Rocco, where they cover North Wales Police, and a Italian contact email address for myself. During the lockdown period, uh, I've also circulated a presentation, which is all audio and visual to the contacts I've had in schools and colleges, aimed at the younger audience. I'm happy to email this to anybody who would like a copy and is supplemented with a quiz. We've also worked hard this year on promoting the uptake of the Matrix competition, and here are some of the highlights. Matrix 
Cyprus Challenge is a national competition that's run by all the regional cyber crime units. Yorkshire and Humber Rocco created the competition two years ago, and this is the first year it's gone national. We had nearly 8,000 attempt a game in South Wales and about 65,000 around the UK. It was run over four weeks in January and February, and we went into as many schools as we could. The challenge was designed to test the participants' knowledge of the law, cybersecurity, and also tested a person's problem solving skills. Unfortunately, we've had to postpone the regional semi final until further notice due to the COVID 19 pandemic. There are fun, exciting and stimulating online activities available to ethically test, challenge and develop cyber skills, whether or not individuals are considering a career in tech. So the Cyber First virtual camps, some of these have taken place already. There are three groups according to age. The defenders are for the 14 to 15 year olds. The futures are for the 15 to 16 year olds and advanced for the 16 to 17 year olds. These events were normally held all across the country and I delivered presentations at Cardiff Met over the last two summers. Most of the Rockus are involved this year in giving some form of virtual pre presentation, which will normally be centered around raising awareness of the Computer Misuse Act. Uh, the Cyber Choices and Cybersecurity Challenge UK launched Cyberland in May of this year uh, during the COVID-19 lockdown to provide young people with the resources to help them improve and practice their cyber skills. And the Cyber Discovery Virtual School is a free license which enables access to over 200 online security challenges. It's for people aged 13 to 18 years old, and you need to register by the 1st of August and the program ends on the 31st of August of this year. So HN Government's free online extracurricular program and can be joined on joincyberdiscovery.com. Who needs to go to, on a summer holiday when you can have all of these fantastic resources? There are more fantastic resources uh, that can be used for free this summer. I'll detail just a few of them. Um, the NCA have partnered with Immersive Labs and last week saw the launch of the Cyber for Summer program where young people can learn and develop cybersecurity skills. So Cyber for Summer consists of over 100 labs where you can learn some of the core skills for a range of jobs, including cyber investigator, digital forensic expert, and network security analyst. The labs are targeted at 13 to 18 year olds. The Digital Cyber Academy uh, is also uh, run by Immersive Labs. It's a free cyber training for part of full-time students in higher ed education. The Cybersecurity Challenge um, is a, a competition designed to test cyber skills. Uh, I'll name just a, a few more. Uh, Hack the Box is a platform to advance penetration testing and cybersecurity skills online. And uh, Coda Dojo, uh, community based programming clubs for young people. There is a huge demand for digital skills with a large skills gap in the cybersecurity industry. There are plenty of opportunities to have a career in one of the most exciting, dynamic industries in the world. Uh, here are just a few career options uh, available in the cyber industry. Uh, a games developer. So if you know an individual that likes gaming, you know they're not alone. Uh, as technology continues to develop, so does gaming. It might just seem like a hobby, but how about making that their career? Whether it's the creative side of gaming, game programming, or testing and developing the security of games, these are all um, areas that need cyber skills. This year, I delivered two cyber conferences to a cluster of schools in Pontypridd and Swansea. We did this with Schoolbeat and the DVLA's ethical hacking team. This team of ethical hackers gave a fascinating insight into their role which is to use uh, hacking skills in a legal and ethical way. And the school pupils thoroughly enjoy the demos given by the DVLA team. Uh, with regards to a career as a software engineer, it suits individuals that enjoy writing code and problem solving. 
So in order to have these careers, there are different routes available. Uh, you could, have, you could um, pursue a traineeship. These are designed to help young people who want to get an apprenticeship or job, but don't yet have suitable skills or experiences. There are apprenticeships. These are available through college websites and the HM government site. Or bug bounties. Uh, so many companies now offer bug bounty schemes. They offer financial incentives for hackers who find and report vulnerabilities in their systems so that they can be rectified. These can be a great way for hackers to challenge the skills whilst, whilst making money. However, it is essential that the terms and conditions of these schemes are read and strictly adhered to. Failure to follow these or, or to report vulnerabilities correctly can result in individuals inadvertently committing crime. Um, and there's uh, cyber first bursaries uh, that you could pursue. So undergraduates can apply for £4,000 per financial uh, year assistance and also get paid cybersecurity training each summer to help kickstart their career in cyber. This brings us to the final part of the presentation. Uh, before, before we take your questions, if you have concerns over a young person's online activities, talk to us. Have a read of our referral forms that I've told you about. Uh, if a young person has an interest in computers and technology, it's important to have a discussion with them about the use of it. Recognizing the interest and engaging with a young person is key to ensuring that they follow a positive pathway. Anyone can contact the Cyber Choices team, including parents, guardians, carers, teachers, social workers, or law enforcement, as Will has already said. Please note, though, that um, the Cyber Choices team can't work with anyone who is subject to a cybercrime investigation until the, cease, uh, until the case is concluded. Working with the Cyber Choices team does not prevent an individual being prosecuted for crimes committed. However, there may be possibilities for alternative outcomes. There we are. Thank you for listening today. And I, th I believe that Will has been reading through some of the Q&As that have been streaming through. I have back. indeed, Emir. Okay. Thank you very much for the last 25 minutes. Hopefully you're now fully enlightened about our Cyber Choices program and all the positive diversions out there. One, one of the questions that's come in here, thank you for everybody that has contributed, um, is, is, more, is kind of to do with all the uh, things that are out there um, around positive um, ways forward and how to learn on, um, around cybersecurity. Uh, this is one of the first questions. As a third of year, sorry, as a third year computer science student who hasn't been taught anything about cybersecurity besides computer ethics, what code programs or experience should we get for graduate roles? So uh, thank you very much for that question. Um, John, as, as you've just uh, digested the question, Amir, do you want me to contribute to that one first? Great, okay, thank you. Um, so yeah, um, I, think, I think whoever asked that question, it, it was before Amir provided his input around some of the stuff that's out there for you, particularly um, as a postgraduate role, uh, the likes of the Cyber First bursaries are brilliant. So if you haven't looked at uh, going down that avenue, it's something well worth pursuing. And also, as Amir mentioned, just some of the um, some of the free stuff that's out there available at the moment uh, the summer the summer uh, cyber for summer campaign immersive labs immersive labs is a fantastic platform uh, and you can have access to over 100 labs now uh, to train yourself up for free uh, all these things will really help uh, on a cv and obviously will help upskill you with uh, the latest cyber threats etc uh, there are more and more things coming on online that gives you that kind of um, experience you need uh, so when you do go into an interview you can actually say that you have you, you you've off your own back you've um, you've upskilled yourself in these areas do you have anything else to add on that emir oh yes thank you will um just in addition to some of the stuff I've already mentioned with the Cyber First bursary, for example. So we've got a, a Cyber First student who is going to be joining us uh, from this afternoon onwards. 
and he's going to share with us the wealth of uh, knowledge that he's gained through in university and we're going to be working together over the summer period to try and put together some projects so that we can obviously help people make the, the right cyber choices. Fabulous. Um, next question from Lewis. I think Lewis was on um, early doors about quarter to 11. Lewis was keen. Um, how does the police see everything that goes on like in gaming and on computer coding? Um, so, so on that, uh, I, I think what you're saying, Lewis, is how do we get involved in those kind of gaming communities and computer coding? Um, as we mentioned in the presentation, a lot of what we do is going to game conventions, et cetera, um, involving ourselves and, and immersing ourselves in that kind of gaming community. Um, and we also, I don't know about you, Emma, here in, in South Wales, but in, in North Wales and the wider Northwest, we, we get involved with lots of the coding clubs um, at, at grassroots level. I think that's really key. Um, we go in and provide inputs uh, to, to young people and build those relationships as well with, with those teams delivering uh, those kind of clubs because it's really important. We are at that grassroots level. Um, do you have anything you, you want to add on that, Amir? Yeah, here, here in Wales, um, for the past few years, we've uh, assisted with the DVLA, who basically uh, run a national coding competition, uh, which is uh, designed around Scratch and Python. And schools all throughout Wales can enter this competition, and there are various themes. You know, the, the fire service will enter a theme, as will the, as will the police. And, and we've put forward a theme, as I said, for the past two years, and uh, unfortunately they had to postpone this year's competition. Um, but those are the kinds of uh, forums that we'll try and get involved in, really. Um, a question from Anton. Thank you, Anton. Uh, contributed just a few minutes ago, so thanks for that. Uh, have students been prevented from submitting coursework or exams by DDoS attacks? And what could one do as a university lecturer to identify and prevent that? Ah, that's a big question, Anton. I'm going to drop that one on you, Emir. <laughs> have you have you seen any examples in South Wales of that happening? First of all, well, with regards to the case of the example, it mirrored exactly that. So there was a, a cyber attack on a college in West Wales where students couldn't upload pieces of coursework and staff couldn't mark it. And unfortunately, students did leave uh, the course for for one reason or another. Um, and I like to think that. Uh, had we been in post at that particular time, then perhaps we could have had some sort of influence over the uh, young person in terms of the cyber choices that he was making. So this had happened before the, the uh, cyber prevent or cyber choices role was in existence in the region. Um, and I would just urge any, any staff member to be vigilant. And of course, by all means, you can uh, contact uh, either myself or, or Will to come into the college, school, university, wherever, to tr uh, try and raise awareness of the law and, and the consequences of breaking the law. Because, you know, um, as has been outlined with some, some of those offences, that you, you could be faced with some very serious consequences. Um, and a question here from Shami. Uh, thank you, Shami, earlier for commenting on uh, whether the presentation would be available after the event uh, that is certainly being organized through technology connected so keep an eye on your email for links uh, if you want to watch any of the content again I'm sure it will be made available uh, after the event uh, and Shami says um, Shami's from Cardiff Met can we join South Wales Police or Tarion to conduct cyber training and awareness campaigns for school children so again, Emir, that's uh, your neck of the woods. So over to you. Certainly, by all means, I'm I'm open to anything of that nature. And and by all means, if you want to contact me after the forum, then I'm sure we can arrange that um, as and when. Fabulous. Uh, I think we have one more from Padeep, which uh, says, "What are the technical challenges to implement cyber solutions?" I'm not quite sure what you mean uh, by that, Padeep. Uh, technical challenges to implement 
Cyber Solutions. Got any views on that, Emir? I don't know whether he can elaborate with his question and then perhaps we could uh, answer yeah. it a bit better. Maybe if you um, can um, send us a follow-up question around that, Paddy, we can um, follow that up after the events for you. There are lots of technical challenges in delivering uh, our outreach activity, if that's what you mean. At the moment, there are obviously with lockdown, schools um, not allowing anybody in. Um, there are huge challenges for us as a Cyber Choices Network to deliver our messages. We're having to get very clever with it. Uh, hence why we've delivered uh, our first ever webinar today. As I'm sure uh, you've seen, we are not overly familiar with the Zoom platform, <laughs> but, but we're getting there. Uh, so so these, the, you know, this is the way forward I see um, to deliver outreach activity, even beyond the uh, social distancing uh, COVID. Once we've moved on, I think we've now learned that these are great tools in our armour uh, to deliver such activity um, and, uh, into schools via uh, via uh, virtual uh, webinar activity, etc. So we've learned a lot from the past few months, and uh, hopefully it is something that we can utilise going forward. So thanks for that. Um, that I think is it with the questions. Brilliant engagement. Thank you very much uh, to everybody that has contributed for the last hour. We are more or less on time. We haven't overrun. So uh, just in time for lunch. We hope you've enjoyed our events. As I said earlier, please feel free to get in contact with either myself or Emir uh, if you want to find out more about what we do in the Cyber Choices Network. Thanks once again to Carl and the Technology Connected team for making this event possible. We do hope you Enjoy the numerous other events throughout the week as part of Wales Tech Week. And from Emir and myself, it's goodbye. Goodbye, goodbye. Thank you.